Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar uh, on overview of model tribal hemp code. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you have a question, please insert your question into the questions box in your control panel. We'll have members of our team monitoring that as we go through the presentation today. We also have a handout provided here, which is a uh, you can download that in the, in the control panel as well, which is an overview of the model tribal hemp code. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Blake Jackson. Uh, thank you, Whitney. Halito uh, Chimachukma, Blake Jackson, Sahochafa, Chata Sehoke. My name is Blake Jackson. I am a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, but I also serve as a staff attorney and policy officer at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Uh, here at the University of Arkansas. Uh, thank you guys for joining us and being here with us today. I know we're coming up on a holiday weekend and you know some people may have felt like checking out early, but you know we appreciate you staying with us and rounding out your week with everything we got going on. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking a lot about um, our model tribal hemp code, um, providing a little context on how we got there and what the larger part of the project that that's part of. Uh, this is a uh, part of our Cultivating Tribal Food Sovereignty webinar series where we go and provide uh, information on tools that tribal governments might want to use in developing tribal food systems such as tribal infrastructure within their own governmental structure and tools to help um, producers in, in that process. Uh, so with that, um, I will get started here. So today we're going to talk a little bit about each of these items. Um, well, I'm going to start out with an introduction about the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, IFAI, as we call ourselves for short. Um, for those of you that it's our first time joining us, kind of give you a little bit of background on it, about who we are and what we do. I'm going to frame some of the discussion and talk about the, our model tribal food and ag code more generally. Um, so you kind of have an idea of what this code uh, is more part of. Um, the hemp code itself is a component of a larger piece of, a, of our model tribal food and agriculture code. We're going to dive a little bit into the context on uh, from federal hemp law so you kind of know how we got to where we are and where the food code can play a, a role in implementing the hemp authorities in the 2018 Farm Bill. I'm going to give you an overview of the contents of our tribal hemp code and some of the, uh, the thought process about what was behind this when we drafted it. I'll be going over the basic structure of that and then talking about um, some considerations that we we went through in drafting that and how you might want to view this lens uh, when you're viewing the resource after uh, this presentation or if you viewed it beforehand. And then I'll also provide some commentary on different regulatory approaches that you might want to think about adopting and kind of give you some disclaimers on things of what the code is and what it really isn't um, so that we're kind of all on the same page and trying to manage the expectations of everything. Um, so getting started, the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, uh, we are an entity at the University of Arkansas. Uh, we've recently um, been, uh, we were in the Vice Chancellor of Economic Development's office, but we are back in the law school uh, where we started in 2013 um, by our, our founding director, Janie Sims Hip, who is now um, the director of the Native American Agriculture Fund. Uh, prior to being with us, she was the Undersecretary for Tribal Relations. Uh, as part of the uh, Obama administration under Secretary Vilsack, uh, previously on University of Arkansas faculty, came back here after her, her federal role, and she got with um, the then dean of the law school, who Stacy Lee, is, who is now dean emeritus, uh, was the vice chancellor of economic development and has recently stepped down to be uh, back in the law school as professor and dean emeritus. So uh, Stacy's still with us, but Janie has moved on, but we are still carrying forward the good work that we've uh, started doing and building upon that with new tools. And we do this by trying to enhance the wellness and health in tribal communities by advancing healthy food systems, diversified economic development, and cultural food traditions in Indian country. So our work goes all the way from teaching you about our, our, our food code, uh, how to implement a tribal department of ag, all the way to talking about natural resource efforts and youth programming. Uh, we have our Native Youth and Food and Agriculture Leadership Summit, uh, where we bring students on campus uh, to create a pipeline for them early in their career. Uh, and we had to change the format of that a little bit this year, but um, due to the uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak, uh, but still know that we're carrying on that work and we're still here uh, doing that, just kind of give you an idea of some of the diversified work that falls under our mission. But when you sit here and you talk about um, what does all of that mean? You know, mission statements sound great, but they are only as good as you put them into practice, right? So the thing that we like to talk about ourselves doing is putting the tribal sovereignty in food sovereignty. 
we hear a lot about food sovereignty and the ability of a country, a government, you know, a group of people being able to feed their own uh, without um, with unfettered access to, to foods that they want and need and the, and the traditions that they want to do that in. Now that's that's great and well when you talk about the local foods movement and knowing your farmer, knowing your food, and how things are locally sourced. But it has a very specific meaning in Indian country because we know tribal sovereignty is the right of us to make our own laws and be governed by them. And part of that is developing our food systems and regulating those transactions and commerce that occur within that. And so we try to facilitate that tribal sovereignty component as part of food sovereignty through providing legal analysis, policy research, and education resources to empower uh, that food sovereignty movement with agriculture and economic development as well. Uh, and part of that is providing the tools for tribal governments to take, to take that next step uh, and implement those things on the ground level. Uh, part of that relevant to our discussion today is the Model Tribal Food and Agriculture Code that we have developed. Um, the Model Tribal Food and Agriculture Code is a 19 chapter, about 900 page document, roughly speaking. It's, it's a living document um, that is a model set of laws. Uh, so what happens is, you know, looking at a tribal government, might they might want to uh, implement some sort of guidance for their food system, provide some sort of infrastructure uh, for how they want to get things up and going. Maybe they want to start with regulating hemp. Maybe they want to start with implementing a department of ag. Maybe they want to do something with tribal businesses. But the thing that was um, our, our founding director, Janie Hip realized that there wasn't really a, a point for tribes to start. You know, there's a lot of business code guidance, there's secured transactions, there's different things uh, according to different industries and different levels of governance, but there, there's not really a big resource for uh, food and ag uh, at the time. And so she saw that and said, you know, we need to go and implement this resource for tribal governments so that they have something that they can latch onto and modify in developing their own laws and policies. Um, it's not to serve as a substitute for conferring with local leadership, local council, and everything there, but it's at least a starting point to start those conversations. And so we did that. Um, we have released this. It's been updated uh, as federal law has changed to implement some of those authorities, uh, but it is a good starting point for developing your own uh, laws to facilitate food and agricultural production on your lands. Um, and it's we drafted it along with contributing attorneys uh, to facilitate that kind of production and improving those uh, health outcomes throughout Indian country. As I said, the document is very lengthy. Um, it's a very, very long uh, 19 chapter document. Uh, and again, it, it, it starts at the very foundational pieces to developing a tribal department of agriculture and defining the jurisdiction um, that you're wanting to assert in uh, regulating your local food system. Um, we go into very traditional aspects, uh, talking about seed sovereignty, and we go back to more production-based uh, concepts, uh, such as agricultural business entities uh, and regulating ag labor and alternative means of agricultural production, which is where you will find the chapter dealing with industrial hemp regulation. So know that this document is there, that the hemp code is just a small component of that overall structure. And there's a lot more there at your fingertips if you're looking to use hemp as maybe your starting point or maybe you jump straight to hemp and you know maybe now you realize you want to do more there are resources available and i really would encourage you to peruse the rest of the food code uh, as you're going through and regulating uh figuring out how you want to regulate hemp on the reservation so we talked a lot about the food code but we need to switch gears for a moment um, to give you a little bit of context on the hemp authorities and the 2018 Farm Bill. Because the Farm Bill allowed tribes to self-regulate hemp production on the reservation, but you have to meet certain federal requirements. So we need to kind of detail what the federal law was and what it is and what it requires um, before you can figure out how you're going to, how the food code all ties into that. So just bear with me for a second as we switch gears. Um, the thing to note is that there's not been a lot of movement around industrial hemp production in Indian country until recently, because until about the 2014, um, mar marijuana was the definition that hemp fell under because it was everything from the cannabis plant. And this is a product of overzealous drug regulation and policing and some of the political attitudes surrounding that because 
you know, that they both kind of look alike and there wasn't a lot of uh, distinguishing in that when those policies were written in the 70s and uh, the late 60s. Um, so hemp actually fell into the statutory definition of marijuana. And because it was illegal as a Schedule One substance under federal law, you didn't see a lot of research going on in the United States for this. So it's, we had previous production of this back uh, World War One, you know, and before that, but we didn't really see, you don't see a lot of land grant universities doing research on this for this time. Uh, there's not a lot of science. And unfortunately, that's just a product of this being outlawed as basically a drug. Uh, the 2014 Farm Bill kind of paved the way for that a little bit by lifting that ban. Um, if you did uh, hemp cultivation as a pilot research program, uh, you had to do it under the guise of state law and you had to partner with either a state department of agriculture or a college or university uh, in doing that. So there was a lot of um, red tape, so to speak, and being able to access those programs. And some states went there and some didn't, but I will say that uh, the languages were very specific to, to, to state. State and territory uh, is kind of what the language was modified to, to reflect uh, from the 2014 Farm Bill. And because of this, um, tribes you know, weren't really able to access this program. Uh, the only way that they did, uh, the USDA uh, Office of General Counsel put out a legal opinion that you know, there really wasn't a way around that. You had to go through a state department of ag and it had to be under state law through a state university or a state department of ag. So very restrictive and it kind of bottlenecked the ability of tribes to really get going in this realm. You, you might have seen a little bit of relief in areas where marijuana was legal under state law because again, that's more of the regulated piece of that, um, that that Controlled Substances Act was trying to address. But you know, taking a step back, if your state wasn't really engaging in interstate commerce and it was all within the state, you know, a tribe might have felt comfortable going there, but you know, it was very few and far between from my understanding of that. Uh, but luckily in 2018, we saw a huge shift, um, a, a huge shift in the way things go. Um, we see that uh, the 2018 Farm Bill opened the door uh, for you to do it as long as you met a definition of the hemp crop that you test has to be less than 0.3% uh, of THC, which is the hallucinogenic drug found in marijuana. Um, so they want it to be a very low content at that 0.3% THC or less. Uh, that's on a dry weight basis. Uh, the regulations get more into how you get to that point. Um, but just know that that's the, that's the gateway that you have to hit before you get into hemp production and it's not classified as marijuana. Anything above that, um, unfortunately, is marijuana under federal law, even though it might technically be cultivated as hemp. It's that THC level that is kind of the barometer. And with that, um, the 2018 Farm Bill basically said that tribes and states could uh, regulate hemp within their own jurisdictions uh, subject to federal approval. And basically what this means is that federal law set down some basic parameters that tribes and states had to include in their laws and regulations and, and the plans on how they were going to to implement that enforcement authority within their jurisdictions, and the federal government had to sign off on that. Uh, but within this, um, the 2018 Farm Bill allowed for USDA to provide technical assistance to tribes. So if you have a question about, you know, does my plan do this? You know, I'm thinking about putting this in my plan. You can ask USDA, and they're they're allowed to provide you answers in that regard. Uh, it requires that if you are a, able to show that you lawfully produced hemp under a tribal or state plan that if you're going through a place that it's not uh, legal, that those jurisdictions basically have to leave you alone. Um, so basically how this would work is if you are in a tribe that is landlocked by a state that has outlawed industrial hemp production, uh, but your tribe has legalized it, as long as you've pre prepared your uh, paperwork properly and got the appropriate licensure and you produced under the right plan, uh, and the right uh, requirements under the tribal plan, as long as you have something to show and you're in the in the database as having been legally produced that crop, if you're driving through the state to go ship it to another market, uh, as long as you can produce that, they cannot lawfully interfere with that under federal law. Um, but we do see some difficulty in the implementation surrounding that because uh, you know it takes a long time to get the THC level test back. It's not instant and because of that there's a lot of confusion around uh, some unnecessary arrests that were kind of uh, taking place early on because people were 
you thinking it was marijuana and you see sometimes some uh, mix-ups at the state and tribal level as to what that means and how this is being implemented. But as time goes on, I think we're seeing uh, less of that. Also, um, because hemp was rolled into the definition of marijuana, you, probably, you previously could not get crop insurance for any hemp that you had been growing. And it would actually throw you as being ineligible for other farm service agency programs. Because again, you would be growing drugs uh, under federal law with federal assistance. But now that hemp has had a carve out with that 0.3% or less THC, um, you, hemp is eligible for federal crop insurance. And there's a variety of different uh, plans that have been developed and there's some that are in the works uh, as we speak uh, to make that more available to producers. So looking at the, the where the law lays now, um, here are the requirements that a tribe must adhere to uh, when they propose a plan to USDA. Uh, you have to have the procedures for tracking the land where, you've, where you're growing hemp. Uh, and the code that we've drafted uh, has a little bit of that in there, so we'll talk about that. Uh, the testing levels for the THC to make sure that uh, it's below that 0.3%. Uh, and you have to go with a post decarboxylation. Post decarboxylation. Uh, I always mess that word up. Uh, I'm not a scientist, uh, but uh, you have to use that or some other similarly documented method that USDA has approved. And on the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service website, that, that's the agency that's charged with uh, regulating hemp from the federal level. Uh, there is a testing guidance, uh, and that is updated periodically as they get more information on the technology. But again, know that that's also a work in progress because, again, the science is just now catching up to the production. You have to have a process for disposing of plants that don't meet that definition of 0.3% THC because if they don't meet that, legally you're handling marijuana, and that's subject to a lot of federal regulation, as we probably know. Um, you have to have a policy for tribal regulatory compliance uh, with the statute meaning you have to show how you're complying with your plan and what you're doing to submit certain things to USDA um, within 30 days. So five and six have a little bit of overlap there. And number seven is an attestation that you have sufficient resources and personnel to make sure that the plan is going to be followed through with uh, as you say it is. And, and the plans that have been approved so far, this is usually just a letter from the tribal chairman accompanying the, uh, the proposed section of code itself. It could be that, it could be um, in the in the code as part of, you know, just a section that, you know, uh, you know, your tribe has a test, you know, in the, in the legislature signed off on if you've already approved the code. Uh, but just know that you are not green light uh, for, for production unless USDA gives you an approval. And they have to do that within 60 days. And if you don't submit a USD, uh, tribal plan, then USDA has a uh, authority to come in and assume the regulatory authority over your jurisdiction. And that is the default under the interim final rule, which is the regulation implementing that provision of the Farm Bill, uh, what came out last October. Uh, so just know, uh, and, I, and I'll I highlight this in pretty big bold, you know, there are, there are opportunities to regulate this field, but if you do not do this, federal law defaults that federal government will come in and occupy that regulatory space if you don't do it through your own tribal sovereignty. So, you know, depending upon, you know, the attitudes of leadership and where you kind of want to go, um, just know that that is uh, where things will go. Uh, but that is important to know that federal law in this instance does not override tribal law. Um, there can't be inconsistencies here. And this is the only place that this happens in the code. And, and the reason I say or in, in the Farm Bill. So essentially, if a tribe has outlawed all hemp within their reservation and outlawed um, basically includes hemp in the in the definition of marijuana still, and they don't want this at all. Um, they federal law does not supplant that. Uh, it's still illegal within that jurisdiction. You can't say, well, I have a federal license. Uh, the tribe didn't pass a law. No, the tribe still has to create some sort of pathway allowing you to do it. So in this in that instance, uh, the tribe would have to alter their their criminal code's definition of marijuana for you to be able to produce hemp and exclude that 0.3% THC or less. Um, and then at that point, you know, the federal government, you can get a federal license, but just know that you can't just play the card that you're, you went to USDA and got a license and, and find some way to circumvent tribal law if it still doesn't create that pathway for you. But 
if your tribal law does create that pathway and you don't have a department that's going to implement that, uh, the federal government will step in and do that. So we've talked about the 2018 Farm Bill, those authorities. We've talked a little bit about the regulation. We've talked about the overall structure about what has to be in those plans. Um, and now we're back to talking about the model code. Uh, the model tribal food and ag code, um, as we talked about, that large 900 page document, 19 chapters in all. Um, you know, chapter 17, I believe, is the hemp chapter um, under alternative agricultural production. So how does this all tie together? So basically, you, you as a tribe or tribal government or tribal leader, if your uh, tribe wants to regulate hemp production on tribal lands within your own jurisdiction, what do you do? You enact some sort of you know proposed plan or you go ahead and propose it but you don't enact it until you get approval you can do that either way um, you do that you send that to the usda for approval you get a decision within 60 days from them once you get the approval letter you're good to go if not you're going to have to kind of wait and see what they're telling you you need to do differently with your plan but our model food code comes in right here it's that piece where you're trying to develop that framework and really get things going to facilitate that production on the reservation and kind of have that starting point. And so, again, I'll say that this, this code is a model law. It's not there to be a substitute for anything um, and conferring with local leadership and attorneys. Uh, you know, I'll say that because this is designed to be a conversation starter and serve as that resource. Uh, you know, it's not one of those things that you just can cut out the last, you know, five pages or whatever of the code and send it through tribal council. You, you really need to kind of go through it with a fine tooth comb. But we've given you the tools to get started and hopefully save legal fees and really provide a framework to get really ahead of the curve on this. Because we know that resource is needed for Indian country because we were not uh, at the table uh, at, with the 2014 uh, Farm Bill and allowing a pathway for that. So now that tribes are kind of behind the eight ball with states and getting going. Um, we're trying to really do what we can to, to facilitate that production. So kind of dealing with um, the model tribal hemp code that we have. Um, here's a snapshot of it. Uh, I know it's kind of behind, you gotta go through and create an account and that's the, the instructions on that are provided in the literature we've developed as part of a handout. It's provided uh, in some of the communications we've had with you guys. It's also provided within this presentation but do know that the code does exist. That is a screenshot of the first two pages of it. Uh, and again, it's designed to be very malleable, flexible, um, so you can use as a starting point in, the, in drafting your hemp plan. Um, and here's an overview of what it contains, uh, just kind of a, a very 10,000 foot overview. Uh, as with all other sections in our code, we go through and provide uh, what current regulation is and under federal law, um, basically saying here's what hemp is, here's the history behind some of it, here's what the new farm bill does, you know, provides a little bit of an explanation as I've given you guys already, but it's more in depth and it kind of provides a primer for maybe someone, you know, a tribal leader wants to get a real quick uh, overview of that and, you know, you don't really have time to research it, that's, that's a good place to start and kind of be like a one pager or two pager uh, in providing that area of law so someone's got a place to go and, and guide their research if they want to dig into it further. The next piece we do is we put the language from the 2018 Farm Bill in there. Uh, that's the current federal hemp statutory requirements. Um, so we went through and provided that language for you so you can see what the current language was at the time of the, the writing of the, this code. Uh, that hasn't changed since because it was the last time that was changed it was in 2018, but that law is in there too so you don't have to go look it up. Uh, we have uh, excerpted, uh, selected, uh, tribal plans that have been approved by USDA. Uh, Seneca and Blackfeet are the two that we went with. Uh, tried to go with some regional variations so you could see some very contrasting approaches that you might want to employ in the process of writing your own plan. Uh, we kind of give some commentary on things that those plans contain and, and how they provide flexibility and how those tribes have exercised that flexibility. For you. And that gives you some kind of food for thought to consider as you draft your own code. And then lastly, we provide model language that we have went through, went through the federal regulations. We've looked at the consistencies and the federally approved tribal plans. And that is, that's where the golden nugget is in all this, I would say. If you're looking for the quick, just the quick model language that you want to start with, um, it's back toward about the last 25% of the document. It's about 60 pages itself. 
um, the, the entire this entire section of the code, but the model language itself is back toward the end. And that is designed to provide you that starting point in writing your council bill or your tribal ordinance or however your tribal government regulates uh, and provides those laws. So that's there, um, but again, it's not intended to be a substitute um, for your own in-house attorney or working with your own tribal leaders. You know, it's just not something you can take and pass and be specific to your operation. But also, uh, if you wanted to look more, um, you can see the link to approved state plans. There were 47 at the time that this was written. Um, 47, excuse me, 47 states who have done something and had some sort of legislation regarding hemp, uh, not necessarily had approved plans, uh, but there is a link to the approved plans on the USDA website where those are housed permanently. And you can pull each one up and go through it at your own leisure as you wish. Um, but do know that 47 states have done something with hemp uh, legislation, whether it's under the 2018 Farm Bill or the 2014 Farm Bill. That's that statistic I was getting. So uh, what we do in our model language, which is that piece at the end, I'm providing the kind of a, a detail on what we went through and what we looked at drafting is we have that method of maintaining records where hemp has grown for a period of three years. We talk about um, some provisions for doing that and just basic code language that you'll need. Uh, we have the procedure for testing the THC levels of the plant, how to dispose of the non-compliant plants, uh, how um, the uh, policies and procedures for the annual inspections and compliance with the statute, uh, how your tribe will hypothetically share information with USDA within 30 days of getting it, and also that attestation that there is those specific sufficient resources. So know that that is there as part of the model language contents. So um, I wanted to kind of go through and let you guys know uh, that if you've seen some of the regulatory work we've done, uh, the language in this part of the presentation is going to track closely with that because uh, we use the regulations and the approved plans to, to kind of guide how we drafted that model language because that's the guide point USDA has looked at things with and approved other tribal plans. So we've got, we kind of surveyed what was approved and what's in law uh, to do that and stick into the letter of the law is your best bet uh, and things that require a approval scheme of some sort. So this is gonna track largely with federal regulation, but uh, there is a little bit of a variation through here. Uh, we've talked about sampling for THC content, and ensuring that a representative sample is collected by a DEA registered laboratory, that you must have it collected within the flower portion of the hemp plant within 15 days of anticipated harvest. It has to be done by a uh, USDA, USDA approved sampling agent in the regulation that talks about federal, state, local, tribal law enforcement uh, in the code is just federal or tribal because we're really wanting to focus on the tribal sovereignty piece of that. Uh, for the THC content, we talk about ways that you, um, you do that with that DEA registered laboratory um, and you have to make sure that um, that is done by a DEA registered lab for the, for the reason that if for some reason you send off your sample and it's tests what we call hot meaning it's outside of the 0.3% uh, THC level, then that lab is going to, have to do something with it. And if it's in their hands, they can dispose of it if they're a DEA registered laboratory because then it's marijuana and that's the agency that's in charge with enforcing that. Um, the test results must include what the regulations basically define as a measure of uncertainty, um, which is kind of a technical piece. I'm not going to get into that here, but basically the measure of uncertainty kind of acts as a confidence interval and it, Basically, your test results have to show that 0.3% uh, is included within that confidence interval so that the test is valid. We talk about a uh, procedure for disposing of the non-compliant plants. Um, you have to do this through a DEA registered reverse distributor or with duly local uh, authorized uh, federal or tribal law enforcement. That's directly from our model language. Uh, it does not um, really get into how tribes want to do that again we're providing the code pieces if your tribal department of ag your tribal hemp commission whoever your tribe chooses to use in enforcing this can develop their own on the ground regulations we're just writing the enabling language here to give you guys a start um, having uh the, the this gives uh the language in here if enacted as it's written it gives whatever entity that is regulating this the authority to uh conduct that uh, annual inspection at least, and that you 
are per, given uh, unfettered access during normal business hours to any licensee's hemp operation uh, as well. So it provides that legislation uh, for, for you at the tribal level. Uh, the compliance and enforcement procedures, uh, it kind of shows how um, you need to do a corrective action uh, if there's a negative, a negligent act. Uh, some examples of these in federal law and in the code, you know, not given the right legal description of where your hemp is being produced, not obtaining a license or other sort of applicable tribal authorization that you might have to go toward. Uh, another piece of that that could kind of comport is not registering your business under tribal business code. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, if the crop is testing over the THC level of 0.3%, that could be viewed as negligent. Um, you do have a three strike rule with negligent violations under federal law, and that's also seen in our model language. So basically, if you get three model, uh, three uh, negligent violations, it's kind of three strikes, you're out in a five-year period. Um, but the federal law does provide a little bit of wriggle, wiggle room here. If you took reasonable steps to grow hemp in compliance with the tribal plan, you've done everything right, you harvested at the right time, you know, you had your crop tested by a reputable person, you did everything that you did right, um, but sometimes, you know, there's there's recognition that there's some sort of uh, climatological variance, and you know, the science just isn't caught up to where we are uh, with production yet, and that's why uh, federal law provides a, a little bit of a variance here. So if you've done everything right and reasonable, and you're growing, and your crop still tests between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5, you're okay. It's not going to go against that three strike period. Uh, it also under our federal or under our federal law and, and the tribal code, uh, if someone has a controlled substance related felony in the last 10 years, they're not allowed to participate uh, in hemp production on the reservation. That's gotta be in there under federal law. Uh, there's no flexibility with that. If you wanna change that, uh, the USDA will probably not approve that. Um, our tribal code model code uh, verifies this with FBI criminal history, which is what we've seen in a lot of others. Uh, if you are applying as an entity, so if me as Blake Jackson Hemp Production LLC uh, wanted to do this, uh, anyone who is a key participant in my business, such as an executive manager or, an, or a co-owner with me, or with a direct or indirect financial interest has to submit a criminal history as well. There has to be a way uh, that you share in certain information with USDA and our tribal code uh, allows for that and, and has the right safeguards in there for that. Uh, basically, if when you apply, you have to share your producer name, address, phone number, email, all the all the different things. Your EIN number, if it's a if it's a business, along with your business location name and all the key participants. When you apply for a license, you do it through a tribal entity. Again, that's very flexible as to what you want it to be. It could be a tribal department of ag. It could be an independent hemp commission. You know, I will say that the more on the ground level it is, the better because if you have uh, leadership that has a lot of other regulatory and leadership responsibilities in there, it might um, not, you, you might not have as quick of a turnaround and also um, your commerce here is not gonna be as shielded from political influence. So that is something to know, um, but whatever entity you use to regulate, uh, the information must go to USDA within 30 days of receipt. Uh, another piece is parity and transportation. And basically what that means is under federal law, I, and I talked about this earlier, if you are producing hemp under a jurisdiction where it's legal and you've done everything right and you've done got you know got the license and you've you've properly registered everything and have your sampling results basically if you're going through a place that it's illegal they have to leave you alone as long as you can show that that proper sourcing so we make allowances for that as well as required under federal law and our code so if there's a, a you know state and tribal um entity that it's legal under um then they provide that it kind of works both ways when transporting through your tribe's jurisdiction. But I will say that our code language does disclaim that if you're not transporting it and you're just kind of sitting there with it, uh, any person who it, uh, possesses hemp and hemp products which are not being transported uh, through the tribe's jurisdiction will remain uh, subject to the code. So that is kind of a little bit of a hook in the language that we've used. Uh, so kind of going through all of that, and talking about uh, the baselines that we have, uh, what the model code is, how this fits into the larger scheme of everything. Uh, I, I did wanna give some commentary that uh, you might wanna consider. 
Uh, some of this is detailed on the code. Some of it uh, is part of a larger discussion like we're talking here. Uh, I will say that these are federal baselines and these are what we would call the floor and not the ceiling. With that being said, your tribal law can impose more stringent requirements. Uh, as long as you're basically in, in doing that, as long as someone meets the tribal standard, well, they're meeting the federal standard too because the federal standard's lower. So as long as you have those minimum requirements in there, USDA should approve your plan under, under the way the law is written. Uh, but that does not allow you to go and say, well, we're gonna um, allow it to be called hemp if it's at 0 0.1 or 0.2% THC. No, that federal law is there. Um, and and those, those federal requirements cannot be overridden uh, by whatever area of tribal law that you're looking at doing. But your tribal law can impose more stringent requirements and also jump into regulating areas that are not uh, specifically addressed under the Farm Bill authorities and, and, and federal law. Um, for example, um, there is no provision in the code that talks about seed certification and seed sourcing. Uh, and the reason behind that, USDA has explicitly said they're taking a hands-off approach in the regs for that because there's just not enough information on what would be a proper sourcing mechanism and a certification mechanism. But if your tribe has the research and the capacity to do that and you want to step into that regulatory space, you are free to do that under tribal law. Uh, you're free to create under tribal law your own entity or commission charged with enforcing the plan, uh, your regulatory plan that you're putting forward. Uh, a big regulatory gap that we're seeing is basically USDA is viewing their authority with this as ending once you've harvested the crop. There is no federal law addressing uh, processing facilities if you're looking to do something further with the crop. So if you have a processing facility on your reservation, you're going to need to maybe step into that space and develop some tribal law surrounding that. And there's not really a good base for that because there's not really any law on the books with that at this time uh, because this industry is just in its infancy, there might be some out there, uh, but in, in the tribal realm, we've not come across any. Um, again, this is just model language. This is not a substitute for working with your own tribal leaders, your own tribal attorneys, whether they be inside or outside. Um, and it does not address any specific needs for any individual tribe. This is written to be kind of a blanket for a lot of tribes to use and develop how they want. Um, but we do carve out some common provisions that are found in, in tribal codes throughout throughout uh, Indian country and that there's going to be some definitions needed to be changed. One is that, you know, if you don't want to go back and alter your criminal code in your hemp plan, you can uh, alter, you could say something along, you know, you can cite to your criminal code and the marijuana provision of it and amend it within your hemp plan uh, and say that anything that meets the, the piece, the requirements of this plan do not fit within the criminal definition of marijuana because you're going to have some inconsistent code provisions there and that's, that could just get really messy fairly fast. Um, there's also pieces in here that, if, again, if I'm going to be Blake Jackson Hemp Production LLC, I'm going to have to register my business as an LLC, right? So some, something that you're going to have to see here is compliance with the business code to get the proper business license. We've seen that in a few tribal codes. Uh, also, if there's um, regulations surrounding leasing on your reservation, uh, making sure that, you know, any anything falling under the tribe's jurisdiction, whether it be an ag lease under the Agriculture uh, Resource Man Management Act of 1993, AORMA, or BIA uh, ag leasing re regulations, um, you need to include provisions to implement uh, and enforce the code uh, as it's written in our model language. You just wanna make sure that that's updated so that people don't have a gray area on how they enforce that and uh, where they're at. I know there's been some miscommunications uh, with USDA and BIA as to what that means. And I, I've been, a, you know, had to present to a couple of audiences and they asked, well, what do we do with our ag leases? I'm like, well, if this is an uh, agricultural commodity, which it is under federal law now, you just enforce it as you would any other agricultural commodity. Uh, the enforcement of growing it and regulating it and making sure they're doing everything by the book and not growing drugs is is kind of falls on usda and dea so you know there's a lot of implementation uh mix-ups that need to be worked out in that space but if you do this under tribal law your tribe is the one doing all of it and it takes the various federal players out of that equation so that is one way to streamline enforcement and again there's a lot of uh, different moving pieces to this, but I want to underscore that our team at IFAI is ready to help you 
working with tribal leaders, tribal attorneys, um, and figuring out how this code could fit into your regulatory scheme. And also it's a great way for us to see issues that we didn't anticipate when drafting this because we're all kind of in this together and this is kind of a market that's very much in its infancy. Uh, so um, if you're interested in further accessing the code, uh, here are the instructions to do it, which are also provided in the handout that you've been provided. You do have to go on the website and create an account um, that it's kind of hidden behind uh, uh, that wall so that we can ensure that it is getting accessed by the right parties and that you know tribes are the ones that get access to that and tribal uh, leaders and tribal regulators because this, it's designed to be a resource for tribes and for tribal use. And also it allows us to better monitor who's access to it and for grant reporting purposes, we can monitor our numbers a little bit easier that way too. So with that, uh, we are about 40 minutes in. Um, this is my contact information. If you guys have questions via email that might not come up, again, um, my information and as well as the rest of our team is available on our website, uh, on indigenousfoodandag.com. If you go and look at the section dealing with our team and it has everyone's bio on it and our contact information, and at this time, uh, I have a little bit of time set aside for questions if there's any that have come up in the process of this discussion. Great, thank you so much, Blake. And uh, just as a reminder, um, as we, we close out here, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them via the question box, or as Blake had mentioned, you can also email him at the email provided here on the screen. Um, this webinar recording and presentation, including the handout, Will be will be provided via email to the webinar registrants. Um, so if you have any questions on that, you know how to get in touch with us. Um, but we appreciate everyone being here today, and thank you so much for your time. And enjoy your holiday. Thank you, guys.